five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Happy birthday, Justin. Today is Justin's birthday. Justin is one of my best friends and he has type one diabetes, which means he has to be very careful about the amount of sugar that he eats. So I figure what better way to celebrate Justin's birthday than by giving him a giant birthday cake and having him watch me eat all of it. Here is Justin's birthday cake. And since Justin's getting his PhD very soon, let's make it a graduation cake as well. This cake is six pounds and six ounces. Stay tuned. You're watching Eating Cereal. So here are some of the statistics on this cake. So I'm gonna eat this six and a half pound cake and give a lesson on diabetes. And I know what you're thinking, if you eat all that cake, won't you get diabetes? And I can't say anything for sure, but I can tell you that I run about 11 miles a day, which is a pretty important factor that I'll explain in a bit. So let's get the timer started. And let's make it hot. So what is diabetes? To answer that, let's start by looking at a couple of molecular models. On the bottom here, we have a sucrose molecule, also known as table sugar, and the black atoms are carbon and the red atoms are oxygen. Sucrose is what we call a disaccharide. Di means two. It is composed of two molecules, glucose and fructose. Up here, we have a simplified view of starch. And in this case, the gray atoms are oxygen because I ran out of reds. Starch is the main component in breads, tortillas, rice, and many other foods. And it is a molecule that is called a polysaccharide. Poly means many. And it is just a repeating chain of these glucose molecules, hundreds, if not thousands of units long. Now, the easiest bonds to break in these molecules are the ones that connect the saccharide units. So these oxygen atoms here, here. And these bonds are broken down by your body's natural enzymes using a process called hydrolysis. This reaction occurs in the presence of stomach acid and sometimes even before that in the mouth and the esophagus. You can test this by eating a cracker and letting it linger in your mouth for a long time and you'll actually start to taste the sweet glucose. So the hydrolysis reaction is an acid catalyzed reaction where we have a water molecule coming in and breaking the bond between the fructose and the glucose molecule. So now we're left with two separate molecules, the fructose and the glucose. And this fructose is actually not as significant of a problem if you have diabetes because you don't necessarily need insulin to metabolize it. Most of it gets carried to the liver where it is metabolized. So we won't worry about the fructose for the purposes of this lesson. Now this glucose molecule this is where your problems arise because glucose passes right through your stomach and almost immediately goes through to your bloodstream and it's not broken down any further until it gets into your cells. Now a common misconception regarding diabetes is that insulin breaks down the glucose in your bloodstream and that's not directly true. What insulin does is it acts as a cell catalyzer and stimulates cell membranes in such a way that the large glucose molecule can enter the cell. So I'm not going to build the insulin molecule with this set because I don't have enough pieces, but I will use this chip clip to simulate what the insulin does. And this shoebox will act as one of your cells. So the chip clip stimulates the cell membrane such that the cell can open and accept this large glucose molecule. And then the glucose can be broken down further once it's inside the cell. So before I go on to the next molecular demonstration, let's briefly discuss the differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The way I jokingly refer to the two types is that type 1 diabetes is completely not your fault if you have it. 
Type 2 might kind of be. And type 1 is due to the complete or partial shutdown of your pancreas, which is where insulin is produced, specifically in the islet cells. These islet cells are home to a lot of good functions in the pancreas. Not only do they produce insulin, but they have beta cells, which sense the level of glucose in your blood and produce and release hormones accordingly. And in a body with type 1 diabetes, these have more or less shut down because the body's immune system has attacked them. It's an autoimmune disorder, so it has attacked and destroyed them. So this is what happens in type 1, which is also referred to as juvenile diabetes. It's called juvenile because most commonly it occurs, it begins during childhood. That's not true across the board, though. Justin actually was diagnosed when he was 23. So now uh, let's look at type 2 diabetes, also referred to as adult onset diabetes because it commonly occurs in adulthood. And it accounts for about 90% of all diabetes cases, and it's been on the rise with obesity over the last 35 years, particularly in the U.S. and the U.K. And in most cases when you have type 2, your islet cells are performing just fine, but communication between the beta cells and the extremities of the body are not good because you're not getting full blood circulation. And there can be several reasons why the blood circulation is not good. It can be an inherited trait that makes you predisposed for type 2, but it's most commonly due to lack of exercise and excess body fat. So the more exercise you get, the better your circulation is, and the more efficiently your beta cells are able to assess the proper amount of insulin your islet cells need, for, need to produce. And if you don't get good exercise and you have a lot of body fat, glucose can get trapped in the extremities of your body and the insulin can't get to it for it to get into your body's cells. Here is one example of one of the dangers of type 1 diabetes. Most of the cells in your body rely on glucose as their source of energy, and if they are unable to access glucose molecules, they begin to break down other molecules in the bloodstream, including fatty acids and amino acids. These are broken down within your cells into acetoacetic acid and beta-hydroxybutyric acid. If these compounds get into your bloodstream, they are very dangerous because they lower the pH of your bloodstream, making it very acidic, and your organs are used to operating at basic conditions. So your blood flows through all of your organs and destroys them. This condition is called ketoacidosis. This doesn't tend to affect people with type 2 as much because they still have functioning islet cells, and this requires complete insulin deficiency to occur. So there's a condition that can affect people with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and it's called diabetic neuropathy. So uh, how it works is excess glucose in your bloodstream and near your nerves causes nerve damage, and you eventually can lose feeling in your extremities, and a lot of diabetics end up with amputated legs or arms because of that, because you've lost all communication with these extremities. So the mechanism for how diabetic neuropathy happens is unknown, but I have a proposed hypothesis here. So uh, what I am thinking is that during healthy operation of your nerves, these are all supposed to be connected nerve cells, your nerves are ideally uh, carry a slight negative charge. And then if you have glucose buildup near the nerve cells, these glucose, particularly the oxygen atoms in the glucose, draw away the negative charge from these nerve cells, leaving them slightly positively charged. And if they're slightly positively charged, that leaves them more vulnerable to oxidation. And in this case, since you have fluid flowing near these, uh, you can get an oxidation product. These oxidants can come by and produce a product and the product can be sort of washed away. And so it sort of chips away at your nerve cells over time. And eventually uh, it severs the ties between them. And all of a sudden you're just losing your feeling where these nerves are. So um, that's just my hypothesis. It's, um, I don't know a whole lot about electrochemistry in biological settings, but this is very similar to the mechanism for how uh, steel corrodes. And I know a bit about that. So, um, so yeah, it's just my hypothesis.
So um, let's talk a little more about the basics now. So how do you prevent diabetes? Most importantly, you wanna get exercise and eat healthy. And if you're eating a six and a half pound birthday cake, you better be running at least 10 miles a day. But uh, anyway, if you have diabetes, it is important to check your blood sugar frequently and give yourself the proper amount of insulin, but never too much because you can get insulin poisoning. Now, Justin has an interesting system because he has an insulin dispensing device connected to his body through a tube. And we, when he checks his blood sugar, the blood sugar device communicates with the insulin device and it dispenses the proper amount. So that does it for this lesson. I hope you learned something. All right, last, last hunk of icing. Right here, last bit. Oh. Oh. oh, that's it. Oh. That is the end of that cake. I'm not going to say it was too much cake. But I'm just happy that Justin's birthday is only once a year. Whew. Thanks to Kroger for giving me a discount on it. And that's that. Have a good one. Whew. Eating cereal is filmed in front of a live Labrador retriever.